um, but it might as well record it. So the general gist of, of IR spectroscopy is it's it's kind of similar to UV UV or visible spectroscopy, which is what we did back in Gen Chem. Remember those beige boxes that you put the test tubes in and you measured the light in, the light out at specific yeah. wavelength, right? We use that to determine um, concentration. You know how well it absorbs at a certain wavelength, and you can measure how much, how what the path length is. You can figure out the concentration. Um, IR spectroscopy works in a really similar way. Spectroscopy at its heart is literally just measuring light. That's the Greek for it, right? Spectro means light. Scopy means measure. Um, or actually, I don't know what the difference between meter and scopy, but basically it's looking at the light. Um, and the difference though, is that most things that are colored that absorb in the visible spectrum, those are mostly electronic transitions going from one orbital to another, moving an electron around. Um, IR spectroscopy, because it's lower in energy, we not, we're not actually looking at electronic transitions anymore. What we actually look at are vibrational rotation or uh, vibrational modes. And basically anything that changes the dipole moment of a molecule, remember dipole moment is basically polarity, like how polar a molecule is, right? Any vibration that changes that, so it can be something like if you have a chlorine on one and a carbon, if by stretching how far out they are, you're changing the relative strengths of those partial charges, right? Anything that changes that dipole moment is going to be able to absorb light of so, at some frequency. Specifically, most vibrational modes in organic molecules are going to have um, are going to absorb light in the IR region. Some things absorb light down in the radio wave region. Some things up past in the UV region or even past that. Um, but most vibrations, especially from carbon-based molecules, are going to be in the IR region. So IR spectroscopy is basically just looking at what vibrations do we have in a specific molecule. Um, and because every vibration, so most of these, like an in-plane bending vibration, out-of-plane bending vibration, you can imagine lots of different ways where if you have some asymmetry in what these atoms are, what their polarities or electronegativities are, you're going to create these change in dipole moments a lot, right? Um, most of these versions are pretty low in energy to the point where they're hard to measure. There's a lot of things. There's a lot of potential vibrations you can have. Um, so we don't think about these. Ne Plus, they're a lot harder to visualize what's going on. Um, and there's a lot of you have that many different possibilities. But stretching vibrations are really easy. You know, one, to wrap our head around what's happening. It's literally like treat these two atoms like they're attached, like a bond, the covalent bond is a spring. Different springs or different bonds are going to have different stiffnesses to the springs, right? And different atoms at each end of the spring are going to change how, how well something vibrates. If you think about um, swinging on a swing, the longer the swing, the longer the chain on a swing, like I'm kind of like a playground swing, the longer it takes you to go back and forth, right? You change the length of that, of that chain, you swing back and forth faster, right? So what we're really looking at here is depending on what atoms are on each side of this spring, it's gonna have a different frequency. And different frequency means it's going to absorb light at different energies. So is it kind of like Hooke's law? It almost? is just a like just law. Hooke's law, just at a molecular scale. And when we're dealing with these larger molecules, there's lots of springs all attached together, right? Because it's not just two masses attached to each other. You know, even just something as as simple as a benzene ring. as six carbons all attached via fairly stiff springs, and then six hydrogens attached, one hydrogen attached to each carbon, all of which have a different stiffness to the spring as well. So every one of those is going to 
to have slightly different vibrational frequencies. Now, all of these ones, if they're all symmetric, then all of these, if it's a totally symmetric molecule like benzene, all of these carbon hydrogens are identical. And so each of these bonds might stretch the same way, but this bond and this bond at the same time stretching this direction is going to have a, a different frequency than this bond stretching this direction and this bond stretching that direction. So the more atoms you have, the more of these different vibrations you have to think about. So even though it's mathematically, it's really simple to think about it with law. Very quickly, we get into a three-body problem situation where you can't solve everything. It's a little bit simpler than a true three-body diagram, but it's still a pretty complex system. Um, and so if we try to look at, if we had just a hooks, a simple two, two mass hooks law situation, there is one frequency for a given temperature right, that yeah. it's going to vibrate at, right? Um, as soon as you get something like this, though, look at page four of your packet. All of those peaks over on the right-hand side, all of those jagged little sections, every one of those is a different frequency for this particular compound that it's, where it's absorbing light. So a couple notes about this. Um, when we're looking at these spectra, uh, we traditionally plot percent transmittance as the Y value. So something that is not absorbing is going to be all the way at 100%, all, all the way across. Um, that said, even though these are dips, we call them peaks. Um, just because, I don't know if that's a holdover from when they were, would put absorbance here instead of percent transmittance, or just because it being a peak just means that anytime you've got a deviation from the baseline, you consider that a peak. Um, so don't let the, the you know, the uh, so directionality, the trough, the trough is a peak. <laughs> okay. Um, and it's more it's that, more peaks. Right. Yes. So, and then the other trick here is that we don't report these in hertz as a true frequency, but we also, but we also don't report them as a wavelength. This is, this is a frequency, but it's a frequency in inverse distance. So it's called so it's showing So it's showing, the distance, not the time. Correct. Okay. So frequency, because so for for whatever reason, this is the standard. All IR spin velocity is these units. We call them wave numbers. They're inverse centimeters. Okay. Instead of hertz being inverse seconds. The the advantage to that is that inverse wave numbers are still proportional to energy. Higher wave number is higher energy, just like the frequency. If we did a wavelength, then we have that inverse relationship that makes things trickier. Um, although you'll also notice they report them backwards. Oh, the yeah, yeah, yeah. 400 is over there, 4,000 is over here. Clearly, if we were designing this from scratch, we would come up with a better system, but this is pulled over from the way that it used to be done. This is still currently accepted. Other than the sideways, it makes more sense. Looking at it sideways does almost make more sense. <laughs> um, so, but basically all this is going to measure is what functional groups are present in a molecule. Right? It doesn't tell you anything about how they're attached. It doesn't tell you with a, whole, with a great degree of certainty necessarily what version of a functional group is present. Like, for instance, if you look at, you go back a page, page three, there's just a list of, a table of characteristic IR absorption bands. So anytime you've got carbon-hydrogen bonds, you're going to get certain peaks that show up at roughly the same range. But because every molecule is different, we can't specifically say it shows up at 3,115 wave numbers. We get these ranges because there's always a little bit of back and forth there. Um, but that's basically all we're doing is we're going to look at these spectra. And for the most part, anything from 1500 over, we're going to disregard. 
because that's when you start getting all of those out of plane bending um, and all of those other, all that other stuff that makes it too complicated, too many peaks sitting on top of each other to really be able to interpret it. That's what I was concerned about. You said interpret all the peaks on the graph. And so we'll talk about what that means, but basically that, that means from 1500 and up. Um, this, so this is what gets up, you just disregard, or is it 1500 and below? 1500 and up is what you care about. Is what you care about. So left of 1500. Um, this region we still report because it's called the fingerprint region. And it's exactly what you would think of. Because all of these are so dependent on the molecule, every molecule is going to have its own unique fingerprint region. So if you have a IR spectrum of a pure substance, you can feed it into a database and it'll just go through and match all these peaks, the relative intensities and where they are and give you, oh, there's an 80% match for this compound. Um, sort of that's like, more and more where things are going. Sort of like DNA. Sort of like DNA. But that, that doesn't help you if you're making a compound that's never been made. Right? And it also doesn't help you have, if you have something that's a least share of two compounds. If you have trace amounts of something mixed in with your major product, um, that doesn't really help you either because it'll just confuse them. Again, with AI and other tools that are becoming more and more available, the fingerprint region might start getting more and more important and really not have to put a whole lot of thought into this. But as scientists that might have to use this, we also want to know, we don't want to treat it like a black box, right? We need to know how IR spectroscopy works so we know when things are going to fall apart. Because that's when, you, even if 90% of the time you can trust the AI that's going through and doing pattern matching, that 10%, you need to know when that 10% happens. Otherwise, you'll get an answer that's wrong if not know. Right, so we still study things at the more basic level, like from, from the fundamentals from the ground up, even though most of it is done um, at the computer level at this point. Uh, and that's you know becoming more and more of a, of a thing. Um, so what what do we do if we're ignoring everything here? There's a lot of potential peaks here. For the most part, you're gonna have fewer peaks on your spectrum than you have possibilities, right? Because you're not going to have the molecule that has every single function. Uh, and there's a few of them that are really, really obvious uh, once you know what you're looking for, which is what, and those are the ones that are called out here on page five. The specific functional groups that uh, IR is really good at detecting are one, you can tell there's a really clean distinction between sp2 carbon hydrogen bonds and sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds. Uh, and that distinction is right at 3,000. 3,000 wave numbers. Anything to the right of that is lower in energy. And that's where you're going to see your alkanes. So, and again, um, you don't have to flip back and forth, but when you look at this table, Alkane SP3 carbon hydrogens are in that 2850 to 3000 range. Alkenes in aromatics are above 3000. That's a pretty hard line. I know I've, I said that things shift a little bit back and forth, but that 3000 line, that's, that's pretty, pretty hard line. Line. So basically, what you look at here, look at this, draw a vertical line straight here at 3000, like, okay, well, that's to the right of 3000. Therefore, that peak, these, all of these are sp3 carbon hydrogen bonds. And you can't even necessarily look at it and say there's three distinct sp3, because there could be other ones hiding on top in there as well that are slightly different. But we could say there's a post, there's a leak. And even that, you might not even want to go too much because there could be some other. And they're just say there that there are sp. So you can't you can't determine in the amount that that right. happens. They're just in the term, and, oh, yeah, that is there. there. Yeah. And a lot of times, and this is something that's tricky, the absence of a peak tells you more than the presence yeah. of a peak, yeah. or just as much. Because there are no, there's only one peak to the left of 3,000. Mm -hmm. And it qualitatively looks different than the rest of the peaks up here, right? It's wider and rounder. That's a, that's a, a uh, OH bond. Mm -hmm. OH bonds, because you get hydrogen bonding from them, there's a wider range of energies where they can absorb. Oh, okay. So 
This is 100% OH group. And that means that there, if there's no other peaks to the left of 3000 other than that OH group, there's no SP2 carbon hydrogen bonds. So that limits what type of molecule so we might be looking at. Right. I just think that it could be like an alkane alcohol. In alkane alcohol, this is that's very likely what we're looking at here. Because the other ones that you that you want to look at are so are there sp3 carbon hydrogens? Are there sp2 carbon hydrogens? You said yes to the first, no to the second. There's definitely an OH group. The other two things that we can usually tell if there's a carbonyl, a carbon oxygen double bond, because those all show up around 1600 to 1700 and they're really sharp and strong. We don't see that here. So we have a sharp, a sharp peak right around 1500, but there's like these little peaks up here, but those could just be background ones. So if it's like little, little tiny peaks, it's just background ones. It's yeah. You want to look for stuff that's more like the zero to maybe like 20% transmission. Exactly. Okay. Or at least way, way off of the baseline. Right. I hesitate to put a number to it because right, yeah, it could be. Different spectrometers are going to look at or see things differently, um, and then so that and the other big one that you can usually tell is if there's a, a um, uh, aromatic group, if there's a benzene ring, because you, one, those sp two carbon hydrogen bonds are even a little bit further over. If you have them, we don't even have them, so that's a pretty good indicator right there. We don't have a benzene ring here. But there's some other ones that show up. Um, the carbon, the aromatic carbon carbon bonds show up. They tend to be pretty weak, and they do show up around 1500. So we could say maybe that's that. But the absence of any carbon sp2 carbon hydrogens is basically that's a pretty good indicator um, that we don't have a benzene ring. So basically, this is this is the way you interpret an IR spectrum is you basically treat it as a series of do I have this? Yes or no? Yes, no, maybe. Maybe is a valid answer for these as well. Like, okay, well, maybe that's an, uh, an aromatic carbon carbon ring because it's in the right region. It's kind of as described. Maybe, maybe. Right. But you can deduce it with but when you take that side. into account. Yeah. So it's a little bit like a crossword puzzle where you're like, well, maybe the answer is this, but that doesn't match with 11 across. So either I'm wrong about 11 across, or it can't be the answer I thought it might be, right? You have to take into account the information um, to rule things out. And then what you get is a list of possible functional groups or likely functional groups. And usually you have a formula to go along with this. So again, going back to page four, um, flow boil is C10H12O2. So if you've got a, a formula and you've got a, a list of potential functional groups, the big the last part of this of this um, lab is draw two possible isomers. I don't expect you to get it right, <laughs> but I would expect you to be consistent with your IR and with the formula. Okay. And because and then there's other tests we can do down the road that will let us okay if I got it down to there's five possible isomers for this compound, I'm going to do these two tests and that's going to rule out three of those five, right? And so it's a it's an iterative process where you kind of it needs your final structure is going to need to match all of your data. We just keep adding new tests as we find new information to rule stuff out, right? So and we'll. One of those tests is NMR, nuclear magnetic resonance, um, which is more complex to interpret. We'll actually spend a lecture on that in class and just practice uh, because it has even more, like this seems like there's a lot of information in here, right? Um, hopefully it doesn't seem like an overwhelming amount of information. NMR almost certainly will seem overwhelming at first. Because there's so much information and everything has significance. There's very little <laughs> kind of part where like, oh, don't worry about all that. I'm not going to worry about everything. Part. Right. <laughs> um, so that's about all I wanted to say with the IR. So I'll let everybody get back, check on your stuff. Um, and but then just treat it like a yes, no. Uh, if you see anything above 1500, see if you could guess where 
which of these it goes with, but the most important ones I pulled out for you. And then there's like some maybes, but you can deduce them by looking at the higher rating. Exactly. Exactly. Sweet. All right. Any other questions for right now? It's easy enough until we get, here's just another version of that table um, that has it listed. You'll notice from 500 to three to 4,000 again, or to 3,600. So this just, if you think more spatially, um, you could look at it and say, okay, I'm looking over here at 3,000. Here's my alkanes. Here's my alkenes and aromatics. It tells you what type. This has more information, but it's also a little bit more crowded. Yeah. Uh, if you don't know what you're looking at. Uh, but you'll notice all of your carbonyls are right here in this region, 1650 to 1750 region. And they tend to be really strong. So, all right. Um, we will... Um, talk about this in more detail in lecture and when we get into NMR especially, but for now, back to lab we go.